Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Indigithanks 2021. My name is Sarah. I use she, her pronouns. I am Paiute, Shoshone, and Pomo, and I am a lead intern for the American Indian Resource Center. Indigithanks is the AIRC's alternative Thanksgiving celebration. Our goal is to provide the campus community with an opportunity to rethink the Thanksgiving holiday. Additionally, we aim to educate the UCSC community about traditional native foodways. Today, we are excited to host Vincent Medina and Louis Trevino, the founders of Cafe Aloni. They will speak about their work as indigenous chefs who work to promote native foodways. Before we begin tonight's event, we'd like to acknowledge that UC Santa Cruz is located on the unceded territory of the Awazwa speaking Yupi tribe. The Amamutsan tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the central coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. Thank you, Sarah. Hello everyone, my name is Tani Henningsen. I use she, her pronouns, and I am Konkau Mayadu from Northern California, and I'm a lead intern for the American Indian Resource Center. The AIRC is dedicated to supporting the needs of American Indian students at UCSC, and it is one of the six resource centers on campus. The AIRC is also home to the People of Color Sustainability Collective. Throughout the year, we host speakers, workshops, and presentations that raise awareness about issues that pertain to Indigenous peoples. Please note that the conversation with tonight's speakers was pre-recorded, as they are currently preparing for the grand opening of Cafe Aloni's new location at UC Berkeley's courtyard of the Hearst Museum of Anthropology. I am honored to introduce tonight's speakers, Vincent Medina and Louis Trevino, founders of Cafe Aloni. Vincent Medina is Chochenyo Aloni. In addition to his work at Cafe Aloni, he serves as the cultural leader of Itme Cultural Association, a group of dedicated Verona band cultural bearers working to keep Aloni identity strong. Luis Trevino is a member of the Rumsen Aloni community and a leader in the revival of the Rumsen language. Together, Vincent and Louis work to create beautiful Aloni cuisine that allows them to be closer to their ancestors and to honor the legacy they inherit from them. Their primary goal is always the wellness of Ohlone communities. They also work to educate non-Indian people about who they are as the indigenous people of the East Bay and Carmel Valley. Through their efforts, Vincent and Lewis dispel negative stereotypes by actively demonstrating their vibrancy and the beauty of Ohlone culture, and especially the deep and living connections they have to their homelands as they celebrate its original culture and cuisine. Cafe Ohlone is a space where Ohlone culture and cuisine are respected and celebrated, a place where these powerful ways can thrive. Here, Ohlone people can see their culture and cuisine reflected in the public, and people outside the Ohlone community can experience the richness of their traditional food while seeing the vibrancy of contemporary Ohlone identity. Please join us in welcoming Vincent Medina and Luis Trevino. So, Horshe tu hi hemenya, kanakrakat Vincent Medina, kanakalkin taresh. So, hello to you all. My name is Vincent Medina, and I am an East Bay Ohlone man, specifically from Halkin, an old East Bay nation that my family, or we've always been and will we'll always be. Um, I'm also a member of the Ohlone Indian tribe. And I'll translate what Lewis says. And he just said, uh, his name is Louis Trevino. He's Rumson Ohlone uh, from Carmel Valley originally is where his family is from, but very much um, a part of Halkin right here, part of our family right here in uh, the East Bay. Also, Louis and myself are both the, both the co-founders of Makamham, which means our food in Chochenyo language, as uh, our community work that 
that we do very quietly for, for our Ohlone people and our families, and also uh, the co-founders of Cafe Ohlone, which came out of that community work through Makamham. Thank you for your introductions. Um, so really quickly, we wanted to get some background on um, how, how you came to food, what drew, what drew you to food, um, and if you um, studied maybe culinary arts in school, or if this is something that you learned through teachings with your family. Well, the first part of that question is about how we um, got involved with with the restoration of our traditional foods is um, we were very inspired growing up by our elders and how they've always been able to carry culture forward, even through really challenging times and how every generation of our folks from since, since our lands were invaded um, throughout the mission times, uh, throughout the gold rush genocide, throughout uh, loss of federal recognition, how every generation has found ways to keep these, these, uh, these traditions going strong, even if it meant documenting and archiving them. So when we were, uh, both Lewis and myself respectively, in our own families growing up, we both saw that strength in action of those old timers who, who lived through uh, a, lot of, a lot of hard times. Um, I think a lot about, for an example, my great grandmother, Mary Archuleta, who was born on the old rancheria over in Pleasanton. She saw the loss of our federal recognition because of Alfred Kroger writing that our people were extinct. And also during that time, the widespread systematic racism that existed that she uh, lived through, but found ways to transcend. The same goes for Lewis's great grandparents as well, his, his great grandfather, um, Jim Serta. And so we, uh, we saw as young people how culture can be restored, how things are never really gone, but in some cases, tradition might be sleeping. With the right effort, it can be reawakened again. Lewis's grandmother, Mary Lou Yama, says it so beautifully. She said that certain parts of our culture, they had to be put away. Like if you can think of putting something in a safe place, but then when the right time's there, you can be able to see those things come out again into the open, celebrate them a second time, and then it just becomes part of commonplace culture again for our people. So growing up, we saw how that healing could happen with our elders' leadership. Um, we saw how our language can grow. We saw how traditional land stewardship practices can grow, how old religious practices could be reintroduced. And as young people um, in our early 20s, when we were, uh, when we were younger, uh, we, we started taking an active role in this work, um, specifically with language, which led to a whole bunch of other, um, a whole bunch of other aspects of our culture that started to, to become more commonplace. And I'd like to acknowledge that we're part of an effort, part of a movement, but it didn't start with us and it's not gonna end with us either. You know, it's, it takes multiple lifespans to heal something that's been damaged. And uh, we're doing what we, what, we, what we should be doing. When we started to learn about how interconnected our language is to every other aspect of culture, really seeing those things um, become, become stronger in our community, we wanted to see the food be a part of this restoration because um, it wasn't really something that, that um, because of the suppression that our people in, endured, it wasn't something that was as common in our households growing up as it is these days. And one reason why is because there was systematic laws that try to separate our people from gathering, privatization of land, um, especially a lot of our traditional gatherers are are um, we're, we're banned from, from having access to safe gathering spots. A lot of our gatherers are, are women. And during that time, there's, um, there was a lot of uh, misogyny as well. We wanna be honest about that in the early 1900s, where if you could imagine being, uh, being, being an Ohlone woman and trying to gather foods on, on land that's private property or seen to be private property, um, with racist white land uh, holders, that, that wasn't a safe thing to do. But still, our, 
our family found ways to transcend that, even if it meant, um, even if it meant there was some some risk that was there. They found ways to keep gathering, but we also know that the food was suppressed for sure, just like how our language was suppressed. Now, one way that we um, we started to see healing in this is we started to have these conversations, these really deep conversations with our elders. And we learned that these foods are much closer to us than we ever knew before. An example of this is we learned that our grandparents grew up eating a lot of these foods and they missed them. They missed the flavors of them. Whenever they talked about them, their faces would start to light up. There was, um, there was an example of this with one of our, one of the matriarchs in our in our family, uh, our auntie Dottie, who's 91 years old. And she's one of those old timers that really has worked her entire life, like my great grandmother to carry culture forward. And um, auntie Dottie, she just got so excited when we started to ask questions about our traditional foods. And she started to talk about, about the teas that her mom would make. She started to talk about mamakwa tawasi, which is our rosehip tea that her mom would always have on the stove, she said. And after that, she started to talk about these other aloni foods that she ate when she was young, like the, um, the sweet meat of the red-breasted robin. And she was saying how good that that was, how delicious it was. And then that got her talking after she thought about the feathers of the bird. She started talking about our feathered basketry and um, California Indian feather basketry, as I'm sure is known in this conversation, is extremely fine, extremely delicate, and something that we all collectively have a lot of pride in. Those feathered baskets, anthropologists will say that they stopped being made here in, um, in Ohlone land about 200 years ago when the missions came. But my auntie Dottie, when she started to talk about the food, she started to remember the baskets that she saw in her lifetime at her auntie's house. And food became this conversation starter for all these other aspects of culture. So when we saw this and we started to see how close it is to us, we wanted to try these foods. And some of these foods we grew up with, but a lot of them we didn't. And um, when we started to talk to our parents, our grandparents, our great, our, our aunties, you know, all those, uh, our uncles, they, they started to just, when they would talk about it, like it was almost like, like they could taste them. And they would talk about it like with so much love and so much respect. Now, when we saw that, you know, nobody wants to stay in a place of not having things. Nobody wants to stay in a place of, of knowing that we should have things that were taken from us. So we got to find ways to reintroduce those back into the community, but in a way that's lifting up our, our entire community, not just us, but the different lineages in our families, as well as making sure that our elders, that their words are the ones that are being respected and, and listened to, and that they're leading this work. So we started Makamham in September of 2017 as a way to formally organize this community work. And through that, we um, immediately started with um, uh, a three-day camping trip over in the hills east of Livermore, where a lot of our heavy religious old-time stories are, are set. And um, we had a three-day camp out in this very isolated area where we, um, we all just uh, were by ourselves out there. And it was like super mountainous, so beautiful out there. And uh, just to be together over a feast of traditional foods and traditional stories. So many of the younger people in our community have never eaten acorn before, which is our staple food. Acorn, you in our language, that's, uh, that's our staple. That's, that's the centerpiece of, of traditional um, California foods from this area, Central California. And I know in Southern California as well, but um, you know, I just wanna make sure that we're being specific to right here in Ohlone land. Um, so we, we uh, started to, to share the acorn right when the sun was setting. My, um, my brother, he called everybody together, my little brother with, uh, with a phrase in Chochenyo that was uh, said by uh, one of the old timers at Mission San Jose when our people were going through hard times that was recorded in the old documents, the old archives from the 1920s. And it was bringing everybody together 
over something delicious and beautiful. And he, he, um, he called out everybody and we all came together. The sun was just setting. We were all sitting around the fire and we all collectively had our first bite of the acorn together. And many of us have eaten acorn before, um, but a lot of the youngest generation of our family, they haven't had it, but they knew it was something special. They would read about it in books, but because of the long process of acorn, as well as how scarce oak trees are nowadays, it was, um, it was something that only people read about for the younger generation. But I remember when we all were sitting together, we all just decided to have that first bite together. And it was like a noisy, like really energetic um, time at the camp. But then this like silence just descended and everybody was quiet as they had that first bite. And everybody took that first bite and we all kind of looked at each other. And we knew that that was something that was ours. And we tasted that same flavor that is like frozen in time because that same flavor of acorn, the way that we have it in such a pure way after it's all leached and everything is the same flavor that our ancestors from a hundred years tasted, from 500 years back tasted, from a thousand years back tasted, 10,000 years back tasted, 20,000 years back tasted, they, and much further we know as well. They tasted, when we tasted that acorn, it immediately connected us to the people that we come from. And it's such a delicate taste, a nuanced taste, a sophisticated taste, you know, and the way it's often written about in public schools and stuff like that just doesn't, it never does it justice, you know, because that's, it deserves respect. Immediately after that, we saw how much our family wanted this. So we started doing cooking classes, um, gathering trips, as well as formal dinners for our people regularly, so we could be able to have these meals together. So language and culture, being in this place, opened us up to our food traditions. And then once we started, there's no looking back, you know, it's just only moving forward with those foods uh, widespread in our community. As far as how we learned how to make this, neither of us had formal uh, um, culinary training at schools, but we had formal training with our elders. And our elders, they're the, our greatest teachers. They're the ones who um, uh, we value them over any Western education because they're the ones who have uh, knowledge and common sense. And they're the ones who teach us how to move forward in a world where sometimes nothing makes sense. And they they taught us um, how how to cook. Lewis has a really sweet story he might want to share about um, about his family and, and those old time recipes. The next one. Mm -hmm. So food, as was just shared so beautifully, it just captures all these these things that matter so much to us. Our languages are connected to our foods, our songs, or the ways of being in your homeland is all connected by food. And food is also a way that we get to know those people from before, too. When I was young, my great grandparents had opened a restaurant. They had a restaurant for 50 years or so. And the recipes were all those of my great grandmother, Connie. And I never got to know her. She passed away young. But because the restaurant and all the cousins who worked at the restaurant kept her recipes exactly as she had them, I also always felt like I knew her by her food the flavors were the same. Uh, and those foods continue to be made still uh, by the family. And it's just this strong way of being connected to those people from before. That's beautiful. So it's all, it's all connected and it's an act of love for the family, for the culture, for our land, and of course, for all those generations of people that we come from. One thing that we think a lot about a lot as well as you think about how much people sacrificed so that we could be able to be here. You know, you think about all those generations and the hardships that they experienced, but how they found ways to keep carrying on. And they didn't do those things unless they knew that there would be Ohlone people in the future, that there would be people that would be carrying on these traditions, you know, to find ways against all those odds to, to keep these traditions going. When we think about those people and we think about those sacrifices. You know, we think about the genocide after when the gold rush started. We think about the widespread racism, just like the terrible things that, that happened. But then 
about how the culture being continued was such an act of love for, for all of us, for, for the people that, that they came from, but for the future generations too. We think about those sacrifices and we never want to see their sacrifices made in vain. So we want to do whatever we can to make sure we live up to their expectations and make them proud. And also make sure that future generations that are coming up, that they'll be able to, to see culture just transmitted the way it was always meant to, which isn't about necessarily having things have to be restored, but just being passed on intergenerationally the way that it was always intended. And we're seeing that happen right now, which is pretty exciting um, because um, so much of this work, it's tied into, like I mentioned, language. This week is our 73rd consecutive week of language class. And um, uh, our community in this time throughout the pandemic, it's given us a lot of sanity to be together. But um, there was a mother who, um, she, she was, uh, who's Lewis and myself, we're, we're happy to, to have our elders' blessings to be teachers of our language. And a mother named Karina, she was, um, when, when she first started the classes, she was uh, just beginning her pregnancy. And uh, several months later, she had her, her baby and her, her, uh, her due date was on a day that we had language class. And she immediately zoomed in uh, from the maternity ward. She named her baby Tuye, which in Chochenyo it means strength, power, because of what the baby was born into in the midst of the pandemic. And she, she uh, wanted the baby's first words to be in our language, not in English, but in Chochenyo. And now this baby, he's been listening into our language classes every week. His mom works to make sure that he's going to know the language, and his first words could be in Chochenyo. There's a little girl named Amaya who's in fourth grade, and she uh, she she's become a conversationally fluent speaker. Now she's even going around in her fourth grade class and teaching um, teaching kids our language because she wants them to know that they're on a lonely land and that they're right where our family has always been. This is healing that's happening, and those young kids they just give us a lot of hope for what's possible coming up in the future. That's really beautiful. Thank you for your response. And I just hope that our audience can appreciate the rich history of your origins and the connections to family and culture and how, you know, food is, is like, it's at the center of our identities, essentially. Um, it's at the intersection of all of those things. So thank you for that response. Thank you. Thank you for asking. <clears throat> and I should, uh, preface that whenever we have a question, we give a lot of context. So uh, so if uh, you want to lump a few questions together also, that I know that that could be a, a way to answer some at the same time. Yeah, no worries. You're good. Thank you. Um, next, I want to talk a little bit about the ingredients that you use at Cafe Aloni, incorporating traditional ingredients and how you grow your ingredients, where you collect them, how you source them, as well as what are some of the benefits of using traditional ingredients, whether it be health or environmental benefits. <clears throat> so all of our food is inherently seasonal because our people, um, our people eat with what's what's growing and and um, stewarded these these huge areas, so that there was always going to be more than enough abundance. Our um, traditional controlled burns here in California are such an effective way of, of stewarding the landscape. And these controlled burns are actually, they're, they're tied into our creation about how to be able to, um, to encourage growth and also abundance. In our old times uh, stories about how we, we uh, began, there is um, an understanding that when the world was created after the great flood, that, that the world was made safe before humans could ever exist, but also when we came to be, that there was rules and obligations that we have to continue um, that, that stewardship so that the abundance that we inherited would grow stronger every year instead of weaker. And those managed burns, what they do is they, they um, 
open up meadow spaces for other life. They take out the overgrowth that today is leading to these catastrophic wildfires. They also stimulate all these plants that are interconnected to grow stronger. An example of this is, um, is after those, those burns, um, when our people would go out to dig, for an example, our Brodea potatoes, our tiny little uh, Indian potatoes, um, they're dug with digging sticks in that loose soil that's been added with all these nutrients from the ash and from, um, and from that fire. The soil's loose, and when our people dig those Brodea potatoes with those uh, digging sticks, usually a Brodea potato is about uh, the size of like a dime or a nickel, but it has all these little growths on it, which are uh, bulblets, and each bulblet would be picked off drop back into that loose soil, enriched with all these nutrients, so that by picking that one potato, you would, for an example, get five the next, the next season, the next harvest. That's an example of how well these land stewardship practices work. But when um, Americans came in, those, those fires were banned, and uh, we, we haven't had them in that way uh, since. And as a result, a lot of these foods become very scarce. And so we have to be creative on how to be able to source them, but also keeping in mind those obligations that we just mentioned about being good stewards. Because even if you know, our homeland is occupied, it's, we still have those, those rules that we got to follow. Those weren't lost just because you know, this is, uh, we're, we're being occupied by the American government or the Spanish government or the Mexican government. You know, this is always our home. And the relationship to this place runs deeper than, than any colonial government will ever. So we, we have to find ways to continue to be good and be good stewards and responsible. When we opened up Cafe Ohlone, immediately we started to think about how can we do this in a way that's not causing too much stress to the environment? How could we do this in a way that's going to be a positive force for the landscape? And Land stewardship is tied into food sovereignty, of course, and all these other aspects of culture. But one way that we started to source our ingredients is by working with local farms, especially uh, UC Berkeley student gardeners. Throughout the city of Berkeley, there's a series of tracks that exist that are open spaces. And one of those tracks, the um, Oxford track specifically, is where um, Berkeley student gardeners have begun to re-indigenize the landscape and grow um, a lot of our traditional foods for us. Our native onions, our uh, coyote flowers, our seed plants like chia and tarweed. Our, um, there's uh, um, a whole range of foods that they're growing for us there. Another way that we do this is we are gatherers ourselves. And so we go to very specific areas where we know that there's an abundance. And we know if we gather from an area that we do it in a way that is going to be a positive force for that plant, for that plant community. An example is if we go out and we gather our, our yerba buena, which is a traditional mint that we, um, we love in our, in our culture. If we go out and gather that, there's a way to clip the yerba buena that is going to actually encourage new growth to come. If you clip at a certain place, it will allow the plant to be able to grow stronger instead of weaker. But also spacing that out from different areas so that you're not just depleting one source, but that if you see an abundance of, of areas, let's say in 10 different spaces, that you gather just a little bit from each one of those spaces so that it's able to be able to revive itself without having any problems. The same thing goes for when we gather our mushrooms. Uh, we, lo we love to go up and, and um, very responsibly gather our chanterelles and our porcini mushrooms and those delicious uh, umami heavy native mushrooms. But when we gather, there's an area that you cut from. You don't just pull from the roots because if you do, that won't be able to ever grow back again. And that's what we see like these like these, these modern day, they call them like foraging movements and stuff, which is really frustrating to us because these are uh, people who are often um, gathering foods with no relationship to the land and doing so in a way that's very harmful because it's, it's exactly that, it's extractive. But if we're able to, um, to, to gather a mushroom 
we're taught by our elders where to cut that at so that it can grow back the next year. Um, another part that's very important to us in all of this is making sure that we give gratitude too to the plants instead of just taking them as something that that is just like an empty entity or something as some people might think they are seeing them from our perspective which is that 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 plant has life of its own you know that plant has a purpose there's a reason that it's in the world and you got to respect it and so one way that we stay in this mindset again taught to us by the older generation is in our language to acknowledge that plant by its proper name to be able to give give um to say thank you and also to give a, an explanation of what that plant's going to be used for who it's going to be used for what it's going to be used for and what this does is we know the land is here's our language but also it keeps us in a in a it keeps us um, making sure we're doing the right thing making sure that we show that respect and that we remember that that plant needs to needs to be cared for too. Now, uh, another way that we're able to source is, I mentioned oak earlier and our acorns. Um, so we love our, our acorn soup and our acorn bread, but um, because of development these days, it's hard to find enough acorn beyond just enough for our community. We can gather enough acorn for our community here in the East Bay, but it would be irresponsible to go out and and uh, gather, um, you know, every acorn we could find because we're always taught by the older generation again that the first drop isn't for us, that the first drops for the animals so that they have enough to eat, and also it's important that that we're not skipping those those rules that are there. So we. Um, we work with um, some friends of ours who are um, their um, their yokuts and and mono, um, so in Eastern California, and they uh, have more black oak acorn than we have here in the East Bay, and they um, will will source our acorn for us, and it's something that's become mutually beneficial to us. We're also. Um, also being able to, to source that from another uh, California Indian person, which is really nice and a good feeling to have. Um, for those things that we can't gather, like an example is our Brodea potatoes I mentioned earlier. We can really only gather enough for our community and we don't wanna go out there and harm a plant that's already threatened. Um, so something that we did to have that flavor on the menus at Cafe Ohlone is we, uh, we started, we had this experiment a while back, some years ago, where we had a potato uh, tasting uh, experience where we went around and tried all these different potatoes. And we found one variety, it's called a Russian fingerling banana potato. It's a little heirloom potato. And that potato has the closest taste to our Brodea. And they grow, um, there's, there's no shortage of those. They're, they're not threatened at all. And so that's what we prepare them in the same way that brodeas are prepared in duck fat, roasted, nice with that nice salty crunch on the outside. And it's a way that we could have that flavor without causing harm to, to our home or to the plant at all. So that's just a few ways of how we source. But in terms of the food themselves, it's because it's all seasonal, but I also would like to say that our people, of course, did dry foods and have um, have food stored for future seasons that they really liked. Um, but because things are are so seasonal, I'll just give you an example of what we're eating right now. In uh, in fall time, because it's acorn time, uh, acorn is super prevalent right now on um, in most of the meals that we're having. And a typical meal of this time right now of fall time would look like um, like having our, our, our acorn bread, which is when the acorn soup cooks down enough and uh, it cooks down to the point where it becomes um, very, very, very dense. And then we roll them into these little round uh, spears, which is the same shape as the acorn bread has always been made, unless it's the water biscuits, which has a different method of, of preparation. But they get rolled and traditionally they would be uh, baked uh, in earth ovens underneath the ground. Nowadays, we use our, our our kitchen ovens. But when it's made, the acorn, what it has is it has like this like nice crunch on the outside and this gelatinous soft inside that all of the sweetness and the caramelization of the acorn becomes even more pronounced when it uh, gets baked. 
So it's like eating something that has like these like sweet notes, these earthy notes, these nutty notes, something that's so fine. And oh my, like I, I, I love our acorn bread. And we eat that uh, for an example, the acorn bread, it's a staple, but we eat acorn with other dishes. So we have the acorn bread, but for an example, uh, we just um, last week had that with some smoked venison backstrap that we will um, have with a side of, of chanterelle mushrooms that get uh, flash fried with uh, like a little sprinkling of minty yerba buena and salt that we gather from the East Bay salt ponds. Next to that, there would be like a, a big aloni salad of watercress and redwood sorrel, uh, pinon nuts, California hazelnuts that are wet roasted with, with East Bay salts, um, black walnuts, gooseberries, uh, blackberries, California strawberries, uh, popped amaranth seeds. There's um, coyote flowers that have like this nice spicy bite on there and a dressing of blackberry, coulis, and, um, and bay laurel with smoked walnut oil. Oh, and pickleweed also, which is a salty succulent that grows in the marshes. Uh, next to that, there, um, there, there would likely be something like our, our roasted potatoes that are right there or oyster mushrooms on the side. And then having contemporary dishes, like Lewis makes these amazing acorn flower brownies that are such a hit in our community. And um, having those contemporary dishes is also important because it shows that our food, that it's not locked into just one period of time, but that you know we're constantly um, taking things that are, meet our taste preference and bringing those into our culture, but doing it on our terms. Um, and everything has an intention. An example of this of a food that isn't traditional here, but that is part of Ohlone culinary traditions, is when um, when our ancestors went through hard times over at the missions, Mission San Jose and then Mission Dolores for my family, and Mission Carmel and Mission Dolores for Lewis's family. Um, there were a lot of ingredients that were introduced, but only some of them our people really took a liking to, not everything. And when some of these dishes would be brought here by Spain or by way of Mexico, our people would find a way to aloneize them to bring in our taste preferences. An example is we grew up eating this, uh, these, these slow cooked uh, chilies that the older generation of our family would make in these unique ways though. They're not made in the, in the way that often chilies are thought of. An example is, um, we have a dish that is a, a venison chili Colorado that's made with, um, with uh, venison instead of the, the beef or pork and lots of bologna herbs like the bay laurel that's native to California, the, the yerba buena and, um, and some other herbs that, that we gather. And this is a dish that's been in our family for quite some time throughout the pandemic because Originally, when we opened up Cafe Aloni, we were only serving foods that were pre-contact foods, foods before the invasion. But then we started to like lean into a lot of our, a lot of comfort foods through the pandemic. And a lot of those were our acorn and, and our, our mussels and clams and all those things. But then we started to think about other foods we grew up with, like that venison chili Colorado. And we thought, that has a place in, in our culinary traditions. It might not be something that was here uh, before contact, but it's something that was, that was made by our people with intention, and it has a place in our, in, our, in our culinary ways. And so what that does also is it shows that we've been here every step of the way, you know, that we've uh, consistently found ways to keep culture alive, even when that is including adapting things from the outside world into our traditional culture. So those are a few of other dishes to mention, but um, but we we just love our foods very much. <laughs> that all sounds very delicious. And as a Maidu person, we share a lot of similar foods, like <laughs> acorn, staple of my people, and some of the other ingredients you're talking about. I've been reading about and rediscovering. So what you're doing is super exciting to me. And I cannot wait to try your food. I haven't had the opportunity yet, but I'm so excited for when you reopen. Thank you. We're, we look forward as well because our, our Maidu people and Ohlone, or your Maidu people, excuse me, and our Ohlone people have so much in common shared, you know, that, that there's, um, there's, 
there's a lot that we can be able to uh, to see and support each other on. And one of our um, our employees and our good friends actually is Maidu herself, Alicia Adams uh, Potts, and she um, she's uh, from Marie Potts, is that mm -hmm. Marie Potts, who's a, a very uh, respected uh, figure in the, as I'm sure you know, in the Maidu community. So we're we're grateful for uh, to be able to have a lot of support with our California people. And I just wanted to say, you know, the carefulness that you exhibit when you're gathering your ingredients and the original instructions that you keep in mind when gathering from your elders about, you know, taking care of the land and it will take care of you and only taking what you need. Those are rarities that I doubt very many restaurants uh, practice. So um, I really appreciate that. Um, our next question is, um, how has Cafe Aloni had to evolve over the last during the past year um, because of the pandemic? And how has it impacted the operations of um, Cafe Aloni? I know you mentioned that um, you still continue your language revitalization program. So if you wanted to talk about that more, we can. So immediately when COVID um, spread into California, we spoke with our elders about what we should do because our restaurant, um, our restaurant throughout February was was still open, and we were we were hearing about it, you know, spreading through Europe, and and of course, you know, what was happening in Asia, and we knew it was going to come here, and uh, we asked them what we should do. And the oldest generation of our family, they survived through the last pandemic, which was the Spanish flu, and there's still a few people in in our family that that are alive that lived through that directly in both of our families. So immediately they told us to take this very seriously and um, and we listened to their advice. And before there was any statewide mandates uh, of closure, we shut down Cafe Aloni preemptively because um, we the way that the original Cafe Aloni is located, is set up is that there's a large communal table with a lot of people sitting next to each other. There's a lot of communal dining going on, a lot of it's it's like if you can think about I'm sure you know uh, and uh, you know for for all the native people that are here you know if you think about eating at home you know and how communal that is you know it's a good feeling when you're when when we're at home having our meals and we wanted to bring that to our restaurant but when the pandemic started we knew that that wasn't going to be something that would work and we wanted to keep our community safe I mean there's um, we, we we value and cherish our, our people so much, especially those older generations and keeping them safe was important to us. But also we have responsibilities to all the diners that would come there, you know, like you don't want to be risking anybody's health or their life or anything. So we shut down Cafe Aloni with the thought that, you know, what we originally thought is that if everybody just did the right thing, we would be able to open in a few weeks. But then everything became so political with like wet mask wearing and everything like that. And it became very hard to understand. And it didn't happen that we were able to open back up because, um, because there were a lot of people out there who didn't take it seriously, unfortunately. So the bookstore that we were renting a space from um, was it closed as a result of the pandemic. And as a result of the bookstore closing, we couldn't operate in that space anymore, which was um, really unfortunate because we really enjoyed that space that we were in. But we always know, you know, when one thing closes, something new can always come along. And there's always hope for, um, for, for something that's gonna come along that's going to be um, just as good, or if not even in some ways, work out even more favorably. So we, uh, we um, we were sad, of course, to hear about the loss of the bookstore. But when the pandemic started and we started this um, and we we closed the cafe immediately, we turned all of our work um, to the community. The community work was already happening. There's no question about it. When Cafe Aloni was opened in its original location, but our elders they told us these stories about when they were going through hard times back um, after the loss of our federal recognition in 1927, and also throughout the, the pandemics, about how they all rallied together to look after one another, 
how they protected each other, they gave each other food, they would provide shelter if, if each other, if they needed it, if they needed it. And they just did what they could to, to be there for each other. We were thinking that's such a good model going forward is looking after the family, looking after our community. So immediately we started doing food drop-offs for our elders so that they didn't have to leave the houses, picking up things that people wanted, going to the farmer's markets for them, dropping off food boxes, and then um, having our cultural classes all in a virtual form. So we, um, we started our language classes uh, all virtual, which actually worked better than in person, which is a wonderful thing. Um, we started doing uh, virtual cooking classes instead of having them in person. And then when cases are lower in between surges, uh, having um, socially distanced gathering trips, which is, which was just like a, such a experience, you know, to be able to see our community out there, everybody wearing masks, uh, acorn gathering, just such a thing of the time, you know, but such a beautiful thing to see as well, that resilience in action. So um, that all led us to finding ways to be responsible, to be safe and working with our community while still carrying on culture throughout this time. And having cultural programs throughout the pandemic has been has been a, a blessing because you know the, the last the last year and a half has been stressful for all of us you know and it's been um you know especially during during the last administration there was just a lot of a lot of anxiety that people were having all the time and when we would come together for our language classes every single time no matter how crazy the news was no matter like how outrageous what we were reading it was happening or whatever, it just like grounded us. And like our hearts would like slow a little bit, like everybody started smiling and you like leave and you just feel good because you're surrounded by your family and your culture. So we, we knew that this is the way to keep it going and um, throughout the pandemic and, and the pandemic's not over, you know, we know that this is still um, going to be continuing on and we're grateful that, um, that our, our community has been relatively safe throughout this time. Of course, we've, like, like all of us, you know, there's been a few losses in our families that we've had um, because of COVID, but we, we've all taken the pandemic very seriously in our community. Everybody's, um, everybody from the beginning uh, had no problem wearing masks, including us. Uh, we have a very high vaccination rate in our community and, um, you know, we're grateful that uh, that most of our people have been safe throughout this time. So we started to think about how we can carry on Cafe Ohlone's public work during this time of, of not being together. So we, um, we started doing these uh, contactless meal boxes where once a month we make a, a 12 course, 12 to 14 course um, traditional Ohlone meal that is packed in like these reclaimed wooden boxes, usually from either redwood, um, this really fragrant cedar or Douglas fir, which smells like a Christmas tree. And they're just like these beautiful uh, handmade boxes that are stamped with our logo. They're filled with, um, with all of these different courses of Ohlone foods, that some of which people prepare at home, some of which um, we prepare because we don't want to share some of these recipes like our acorn. That's not something we want people to appropriate. And then we, um, we, we also um, curate that uh, play the, the, the meal box with like a playlist that our grandparents curate, which has like all these ballads that we grew up listening to these, these oldies and like these sweet songs that, that just like hit soft spots in our, in our hearts. Um, Ohlone herbs and flower bouquets that we gather and that, that are made for us and uh, a video message that interprets every part of the meal so that they can understand um, what the relationship is with each course to our culture. You know, it's not just choosing random foods or using whatever foods we can find because they're indigenous to North America, but we wanna be specific, not even to just what's indigenous to California, but what's indigenous to right here in the East Bay and Carmel Valley because we believe that, that when we're as close as possible to our specific um, traditions, that that's one way that we can honor our specific ancestors and also our present day reality. 
um, California, it's such a diverse place in, in, in traditionally in the old time days as it still is today. But that's one thing that's so beautiful about California is how much is represented over 120 different languages, over 100 different tribal, uh, you know, um, like larger groups. You know, there's so much abundance in California. So to be able to share um, one part of that means a lot to us. Um, so we're currently in the stages of reopening Cafe Ohlone, which as we said, you know, once one opportunity closes, often a new door opens. And we're going to be reopening a much larger version of Cafe Ohlone, as, as I think um, some of you might know at UC Berkeley, which is um, going to be, it's, it's such a big vision and we're so excited because we, uh, we just saw the first blueprints um, that our designers uh, from, uh, Terramoto that they sent us, and these, these, uh, what we shared with them as our vision is to recreate an outdoor space, which is currently um, a, just a, a large uh, patio that is surrounded by four walls, four big walls. Recreate that to look like you're walking into a traditional Ohlone village. So that what that would look like is when you walk through the gates there would be the slope that would be there of crushed shell to be evocative of our old time shell mounds. So many of them have unfortunately been, been leveled through colonization, but they're still extremely um, important places in our culture. So you walk up the, the slope uh, of, of crushed shell and in the center, there's a, a huge oak tree that's planted right there with all of these um, these little meandering paths that move throughout this courtyard into individual dining pods that have raised planter beds that are towering with, um, with, with uh, native plants, like our, our native sages, our black sages and hummingbird sages, our mugwort, our artemisia, uh, our seed plants, uh, flowers to encourage pollinators, um, having edible plants that are there that people can be able to pick as they're walking through like California strawberries and our native blackberries, murals that are covering all of the four walls, the, excuse me, two of the walls by one of our respected um, elders, um, Auntie Jean Lamar, who is um, part Maidu herself. I, uh, so uh, we, as I said, we, we have a lot of Maidu uh, relationships. And so we, she's somebody that we just have so much love for. And, she painted the Ohlone murals in, in Berkeley back in, um, back in 1999 when I was a kid. And they just mean so much to our family. And she, she um, offered to, to paint these, uh, these, these murals for us at Cafe Ohlone, which we were just so excited about. There's going to be constant projections throughout the space of bird life, of native birds, like silhouettes going in and out of, um, of our elders who saved our language being um, photos of them being being projected onto the walls, words in our language, um, our, our grandparents, um, there's going to be a ramada that's there, that's going to look like, um, like one of our traditional shade shelters made from willow and thatched tule, but it's going to be water resistant as a way to keep the space um, going when we have uh, rain come. Uh, it's going to be uh, a beautiful space and um, full of abalone shells, um, of, of feathered adornments that's coming down, um, twinkling lights above, uh, in our language represented heavily throughout the entire space, and a space that's unique to, to our culture, really showing how beautiful traditional California culture is, how beautiful traditional Ohlone culture is. And so um, we're in the stages of reopening. It's not gonna happen um, in November as we thought originally, but it's more likely going to be uh, January of next year. So we're, we're moving along with this, we're progressing and it's definitely happening. And a few months ago, we, we got the keys, so it's official. That is so exciting to hear about your new location in UC Berkeley, especially since UC Berkeley has such a long history, long complicated history with native people of California. And so it's really good to hear that you'll have a space there taking back that little piece and, and Cafe Ohlone will be at the center of the Anthropology Hearst Museum. 
So yeah, um, unfortunately that's all we have time for today. Um, but we did want to ask you about the cooking demo. If you have any idea on what we're going to be seeing. So we were thinking of sharing something that is um, accessible to folks who want to um, make one of these dishes with us. So we were thinking about sharing um, a chia porridge aloni style with a blackberry bay laurel uh, coulis, which is something that's really fun to make. It's, uh, it's something that people can do at home um, because there's a lot of alternatives that people can use and um, and showing how that's made and we've done it a few times and then people start making it every morning for an example it's like a breakfast food and sharing the cultural context of why that's so important to us as well because chia is an old-time ingredient that um, that we really have a lot of respect for thank you all for listening and wanting to share some of our work. It's um, the more that people know that Ohlone people are here and um, California Indian people as a whole, the better it is for our realities because folks, they're not gonna put us in the past. They'll carry us into the future and be less likely to disrespect us. You know, if they know that there's a living community that's right here. So we appreciate the visibility and, uh, and, and the work that you're all doing as well to, to lift up Native students on campus. So thank you all. We say utas utmakam, that means take care of yourself. Urshetu hi hemmenya, nesa mak ukshere pati. Now let's make chia porridge, aloni style. We're going to be introducing all of these different ingredients and also sharing how these ingredients are going to be, are going to be implemented into this dish right here. As the chia is being made, we'll talk about the importance of chia and why we make this dish in aloni households and also to know that this is an old ingredient that our family has always eaten and loved, and one that we're still eating today and that we'll have in our future too. So first, we're going to show pati, chia seed. These are the chia seed flowers right here in this abalone. And these are the chia seed flowers before the seeds come out, the flower pods. These are the California chia flowers in particular. And out of these seed pods come our chia seeds. These chia seeds right here, pati in our language, they're uh, so delicious and so good for you, full of protein, full of vitamin B, full of good fats, and they're food that also helps give a lot of energy. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. For our sweetener that we're going to use, you can use any sweetener that you like, you can use honey, agave, but we're using a very traditional sweetener of warepmin, candy cap mushrooms. These candy cap mushrooms have a taste that's similar to vanilla and maple. Uh, it's such a wonderful flavor and they're so aromatic. These mushrooms grow right here in the East Bay where our family has always been. And these are a, a mushroom that we use as a natural sweetener, as a native sweetener in this chia seed porridge. We also uh, have ground up these uh, mushrooms and that's going to be added in just a bit. We also have our, our nut milk right here, which is black walnut milk, chetet si in our language, but please use any kind of nut milk that you like. You can use almond milks, hazelnut milks. If you prefer oat milk, go ahead. But this is a, a black walnut milk that we make here at home. We're also going to top the finished pati, the finished chia seed porridge, with a layer of chetet, which are all, uh, excuse me, walnuts. And these are specifically uh, English walnuts, not the black walnuts right here, but these are English walnuts. And uh, these are nice and oily. We love their flavor as well. 
And after we add those walnuts, we're going to add a layer of Enes Min, which is our dried California strawberries. The California strawberries are very sweet. They're a native variety of strawberry right here to California. And these little tiny strawberries, once they're dried, they uh, will complement this chia seed porridge as fresh strawberries aren't commonly available as we're now in fall time. And so these dried strawberries are reflective also of the season that we're in. And we're going to finish off this uh, pati, this chia seed porridge with the topping of mamakwasi, which is a kuli that is made of blackberry. This one right here specifically in the directions, there's a blackberry kuli. This one is one made from rose hip. And so there's variation that you can use using the base recipe that we shared with all of you. This, uh, this, this mamakwa si is a rose hip uh, kuli that has bay laurel added to it, California bay laurel. And we'll show you how to add that and also walk you through that preparation process as well once we get there. So let's start by mixing our chia together and starting the base of what's going to be these wonderful chia seed uh, parfait cups with the porridge as the base. So we're going to start off right here. This is one cup of pati, one cup of chia, and that's going to fully be added into this bowl. And we're doing a recipe for this demonstration of one to two meaning there's one cup of chia to two cups of the, of the liquid, the black walnut milk. If you're in a rush and you wanna eat this quickly, this is how you do it. One cup of chia to two cups of liquid. However, if you're letting it sit overnight, you expand the liquid, the quantity of it. So instead, if you are making this overnight to have in the morning for breakfast, you're going to use one cup of chia to four cups of liquid. So this is the quicker version right here for the sake of this demonstration. Now we're using a traditional acorn whisk right here. This is made from dogwood and it's a traditional whisk for uh, stirring acorn soup as it's being prepared. This is also something in our culture that we use for chia, chia porridge as well. And in, if I'm assuming a lot of people might not have acorn whisks at home. And so please use a fork in the substitution of a traditional acorn whisk. The first very important step here when you start adding liquid is to make sure that you add that liquid very slowly and also very thoroughly throughout the entire, the entire mixture of the chia. You're going to add it slowly and you're going to consistently be whisking that chia so that every seed is coated with liquid. If you, don't, if you don't mix it thoroughly, what will happen is the chia will come together very quickly and create these big clumps that are hard to separate. Once those clumps are there, they don't give the ideal texture. So we want to avoid that by consistently stirring. In Chocheno, we say hikwe, hikwe, which is stir, stir. You're going to keep stirring that until every chia seed is uniformly covered with liquid and to make sure that there's no lumps. In our culture, we have uh, an expression which is nobody likes lumpy chia. So please make sure that all your chia is uniform and uh, that it's all perfectly smooth. You're just going to keep mixing this and adding that liquid bit by bit. As Lewis is mixing, this chia seed porridge together. I'd like to share with you a little bit of the cultural context of this dish. One reason that we eat chia seed porridge for breakfast and after dinner is because chia seeds, they are a natural source of energy without caffeine. It's because of all their dense vitamins, the vitamin B that I described earlier, the protein that's in there, as well as these really good, robust fats that are in these chia seeds. In the old days, before we have email and phone and texting, the way that our people would be able to spread important messages to different East Bay nations, to different nations even further out, 
is that our people, there's a traditional class in Ohlone culture of people who are called towek shekma, runners in our language. And their main profession is to be able to run village to village, nation to nation, to spread important messages. Before they would go running, they would drink a mixture of chia and water for endurance so that they could have energy before those long runs. What Lewis is holding up right there in that beautiful shoro muscle shell is those ground candy cap mushrooms. Now, this is where sweetener is added. So right now we're going to add that sweetener there, but you're still mixing the chia consistently. Keep in mind, this is if you want the quicker recipe. If, you, if every seed is already coated with liquid, and if you're using the longer recipe, which again is one cup of chia to four cups of liquid, make sure everything is smooth and put it in your refrigerator and let it sit overnight. But make sure it's thoroughly mixed and every chia seed is covered and there's no lumps. Use your fork to whisk that together. Now, as Lewis is mixing this right here, this is where if you are using honey or agave, where you uh, will add that, that, that sweetener right now and mix it all thoroughly in. Uh, sometimes people will ask us, what measurement do you use for this? And the way that we do it at home is it's just until it meets your taste preference, until it's just sweet enough. And that leaves a lot of room. So if you don't like it too sweet, which is how it's common in our culture, we like things sweet, but not excessively sweet, then use a more, um, a, a more moderate uh, sweetener amount. But if you like it, if you have a sweet tooth, go ahead and uh, add as much as you'd like to meet those taste preferences of yours. As Lewis is mixing this, very quickly, you can already see with your eyes how the chia seeds have expanded. They lose their outer shell and they become gelatinous. And right there, as Lewis is mixing it, already the chia has taken on a density and a form of its own. These chia seeds, they're a traditional, uh, again, a traditional endurance food. Right here in this area, in the San Francisco Bay Area, the East Bay, this is right here, the densest population of indigenous people anywhere north of the Aztec Empire, Tenochtitlan in Mexico City, and all of the Western Hemisphere. One reason that the population here is so dense and that we have such a robust ancient human civilization that's been stable and carried on for all these generations, including into the present day, is because of the amount of resources and the abundance of resources and biodiversity here in the San Francisco Bay Area. But I'd like to add that these resources were also managed and stewarded by our people for thousands of years. And we're still doing those things even nowadays, even if it might be in slightly different forms, they're still rooted in all of those older methods that work so well and are so specific here. One of those old methods is our controlled burns. These controlled burns, which take out overgrowth that today is leading to the wildfires we're experiencing, but at the same time, stimulate interconnected plant communities to grow stronger. It opens up meadow spaces for other life to be able to flourish. It enriches the soil with nutrients. And at the same time, it allows for all this abundance to grow stronger every year instead of weaker. In those seed plants, in those, those areas where those seed plants are growing strong after those burns, our people, they would go out with these beautiful burden baskets attached to their foreheads with soft leather. These burden baskets drop on, the, on their backs and they go down their backs and their seed beating baskets that are held in each hand. And traditionally in unison, people walk through those meadows where those seed plants are beat those seed plants like the chia flowers and swoop those loose seeds into the baskets behind their heads, singing often in unison in this beautiful way where quickly these seeds, which are so nutrient dense, would be gathered in large amounts. This is how chia is traditionally gathered. It's a beautiful process and something that gives us a lot of pride when we think about those old ways. But also, please know that those old ways, that they're not lost and they're not gone. They're still with us today. 
We're modern people, but everything that we do is rooted in our Ohlone traditions, in our cultural traditions that are specific right here to this place. It looks already like our pati, our chia seed porridge is finished. So now we're going to start making these, these uh, parfait cups. The first step is you're going to scoop up your desired amount of pati, chia, into the base of your cup or your bowl. That chia, it's going to be uh, already lightly sweetened, so you're not going to need to add any other sweetener to that. And after we have that, that base right there of chia, then we're going to add the next step, which is going to be our, our sauce. Now, the way that you make the sauce, and I'd like to say this just before it's added, is you're going to, you're going to uh, boil down those blackberries. You could also use strawberries if you'd like, if they're in season, um, whatever kind of fruit really that you like as a base. And you're going to, to with just a, a couple of tablespoons of water, about two tablespoons, you're going to add the, the, um, the water first to a pot, add one bay leaf to the pot as well. Bay leaves can also be purchased commercially. They're not the same as the California bay. They're about, um, they're about half as strong as the California bay laurel. But if you'd like to make it a more pronounced bay flavor, add two of those leaves there. And then add uh, about uh, two cups of the fruit that you like to use. After the berries start to turn color, then that's when you take out the bay leaves and you, with an immersion blender or even a, a, a masher, you could uh, be able to blend that or even just press it if you like those berries still whole and they still have some bite. But if you like it smooth, use an immersion blender, pulse it just a few times, and very quickly that will become a sauce. The sauce, it can be used in many different ways, but we're using it right here specifically with our chia. Now we're going to add a couple of spoons full of the sauce onto the chia seed porridge. And again, add as much as you like, or as little as you'd like to it. But it's, uh, this is going to add a nice jammy texture to the chia that's going to also be able to mix in very nicely and add just a little bit more sweetness and that really delicious herbal bay flavor that we love so much. After we have the sauce that's added, the kuli, now we're going to go and we're going to add a layer of walnuts. If you'd like to use walnuts, please do, but also feel comfortable making this something that you'll eat regularly. So if you prefer pecans, if you prefer hazelnuts, if you like a melange of all these different nuts, go ahead and make it into something that meets your taste preferences. After we have those, those walnuts spread, we're going to now go and spread those dried California strawberries. Those California strawberries, again, can be substituted for if you'd like any other type of dried fruits, or if you'd like to have um, fresh fruit that you get from the farmer's markets. Right now, persimmons, they're in season. They're not a native fruit, but they're something that are real flavorful and work well with this nicely. Um, make it into something that you're comfortable uh, eating again, and that that meets your taste preferences, but we love these dried California strawberries. And right here, very quickly, we have our pati. We say, hiti makorshe pati. We look at our beautiful chia right here. And right here, again, it's a base of black walnut milk, chia seed porridge that's sweetened with ground candy cap mushrooms. There's the rose hip kuli, that's the middle layer. There's a layer of English walnuts, a layer of dried California strawberries. And as you dig your spoon into that and take one bite, you'll be able to get one of these components of every one of those different layers of ingredients and all their flavor profiles, they meld very nicely. This is a aloni dish that is something that we have regularly at home. It's something that we eat regularly for breakfast and after dinners. It helps give us more energy, full of nutrients, full of vitamins, and full of good fats. We hope that as you eat this dish, you can think about our living community. 
in Chochenyo language, which is the first language of right here in the Inner East Bay, we say Holshe Maknunu, our culture is beautiful. Tuye Makmuek Ma, our people are strong. Makin Rote Nomo, Makware Hementuhi. We've always been here in our home. Hushish Tak, in the future. Uyakish, yesterday. At Netuhi just like today. Thank you all for taking this time to learn about our beautiful culture. Please know the Ohlone people are here. We've always been here in our home and we'll be here tomorrow also. Utas makam, take care of yourselves and come and have a meal with us someday at Cafe Ohlone. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Vincent and Lewis, for being our guests tonight and for that wonderful cooking demonstration. If folks would like to stay updated on what's happening with the AIRC, we have Facebook, Instagram, and a website where you can sign up for our weekly newsletter. We also have a YouTube channel where you can watch recordings of our previous virtual events. Tonight's event was recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel soon. We will be sharing it via email with everyone who registered for tonight's event. Also, please be sure to complete our event evaluation form. We would really appreciate your feedback so we can continue to improve our events. You can scan the QR code on the screen using your phone's camera, or you can go to bit.ly slash indigithanks 21 eval All those who registered for tonight's event will receive a follow-up email with the link as well. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Rebecca Hernandez, the director of the American Indian Resource Center. I use she, her pronouns, and I am Warm Springs and Mescalero Apache. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. I want to extend a special thanks to our speakers, the AIRC team, especially Jemsey Ortiz, our program coordinator, and the Cowell Coffee Shop. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We appreciate your support.